Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Beter, and I'm a product manager on Android Things. Today, I'm going to talk to you about Google services on Android Things and how adding these services to your device can unlock your device's potential. What I really want to convince you of today is not only is integrating Google services on Android Things really, really easy and really, really seamless, but it can make a huge difference in the use cases that you can put on your device as well as for your end users. At, at I.O. this year, we have many sessions on Android Things, as well as demos in the sandbox area and code labs for you to learn more about what's possible on Android Things. I also know that many of you are coming to this session already with ideas of devices that you want to make on Android Things or for IoT devices in general. And I want to show you today all the compelling use cases that you can get when you integrate some of these Google services. So I'm going to go through a number of services today. First, I'm going to talk about Google Play services, which includes a whole suite of tools, such as the mobile vision APIs, location services, as well as Firebase. After that, I'm going to dive into Firebase in a little bit more detail to show you how the real-time database that Firebase provides can allow you to publish and persist data and events in interesting ways. After that, I'm going to go into TensorFlow and how TensorFlow, we think, is the perfect application of the powerful on-device processing of your Android Things device to really add intelligence to that device. Next, I want to talk about Google Cloud Platform and how using Google Cloud Platform, you can train, visualize, and take action on your devices in the field. Finally, I'm going to touch on the Google Assistant and all the amazing use cases that you can get when you integrate the Google Assistant on Android Things. Before I dive into these services, I want to quickly go over Android Things. So Android Things is based on a system on module design. This means that we work really closely with our silicon partners to bring you modules, which you can place directly into your IoT devices. Now, these modules are such that it's economical to put them in devices when you're making millions of devices, or if you have a very small run, or if you're just prototyping a device. So earlier today, we actually had a session specifically on going from prototype to production on Android Things, which can give you more detail about how it's feasible to do all this, all the hardware design, and bring your device to production on Android Things. The Android Things operating system is then placed on top of these modules. So Android Things is a new vertical of Android built for IoT devices. Since we work so closely with our silicon partners, we're able to maintain these modules in new ways. It allows these devices to be more secure and updatable. Also, since it's an Android vertical, you get all the Android APIs they're used to for Android development as well as the developer tools and the Android ecosystem. In addition, on Android Things, we've added some new APIs, such as peripheral I.O. and user drivers that allow you to control the hardware on your device in new ways. We've also added support for a zero display build for IoT devices without a screen. But really, the key piece of Android Things, I believe, is the services on top. Because of the API surface that Android Things provides, it makes it much easier for Google to put our services on top of Android Things. I say endless possibilities here because not only does Google already support all the services I'm going to walk you through today, but any services that Google makes in the future will be much more portable on Android Things because of this API surface. So now let's start diving into some of these services. Let's talk about Google Play services and all the useful tools that it provides. Google Play services gives you access to a suite of tools, some of which you see here. So you get things like the mobile vision APIs, which allow you to leverage the intelligence in your Android camera to identify people in an image, as well as faces and their expressions. You also get the nearby APIs, which lets you, when you have two devices near each other 
allows those devices to interact with each other in interesting ways. You get all the cast APIs, which lets you, from your Android Things device, cast to a cast-enabled device somewhere else. Next, you get all the location services, which lets you query things like, what are the cafes near me? And what are their hours? You also get the Google Fit APIs, which allow you to attach sensors and accelerometers to your device and then visualize this data as steps or other activities in interesting ways. Finally, you get Firebase, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Some of you might know about CTS certification and how CTS certification is a necessary step in order to get these Google Play services. With Android Things, because of our hardware model that I just talked about, these modules actually come pre-certified. So they're all pre-CTS certified, meaning Google Play services will work right out of the box. You have to do absolutely no work to get these Google Play services on your Android Things device. We also have for Android Things a custom IoT variant of Google Play services. Now, I actually think this is a pretty big deal. This allows us to make Google Play services more lightweight by taking out things like phone-specific UI elements and game libraries that we don't think are relevant for IoT devices. We also give you a signed out experience of Google Play services, so no unauthenticated APIs, because these just aren't relevant for many IoT devices. So now let's dive into Firebase in a little bit more detail. I want to walk you through one of our code samples. So this is a code sample for a smart doorbell using Firebase. It involves one of our supported boards, as well as a button and a camera. So I'm going to walk you through this diagram. On the left, you see a user interacting with the smart doorbell. What happens is they press the button on the smart doorbell, and the camera takes a picture of them. On the right, there's another user who, in their Android phone, there's an, they can use an app to connect to a Firebase database that can retrieve that image in real time. So how does this work? When you press the button on the smart camera, and, and uh, the camera takes a picture of you. Then, using the Android Firebase SDK, which uses the Google Play Services APIs all on the device, it sends this image to the Firebase database in the cloud. The user on the other end can then use the exact same Google Play services and Android Firebase SDK on their phone to connect to this Firebase database and retrieve that image. In our code sample, we also send this image to the Cloud Vision APIs to get additional annotations about what's in the image. So these annotations could be something like, in this image, there is a person holding a package. So that can give you additional context about what's going on. It's pretty cool. If you actually go and build this demo, you can see when you press the button and it takes a picture, in less than a second, the picture will appear. And then a few seconds later, after the image is propagated through the Cloud Vision APIs, the annotations will appear as well. So to really show you how this works, I want to walk through some of the code that pushes this data to Firebase. So the first line you see here is just creating a new door ring instance that we're going to use in our Firebase database. Then all we need to do to make this data appear in our Firebase database is set the appropriate fields of our door ring instance. So here you, can, here you can see in the highlighted portion, we're setting the timestamp and the image fields so that uh, with the server timestamp and the image URL, and then this, this image, uh, as, as well as the timestamp, will appear in our Firebase database to be retrieved by the user on the other side. As I mentioned in our code sample, we also send our images to the Cloud Vision APIs to get those annotations. So we do that by calling the Cloud Vision APIs and then simply setting the appropriate field for those annotations so that that additional context will appear as well for, uh, for the user on the other end. So Firebase is one of the many Google Play services that you get with Android things. But in the interest of time, I can't talk about all the Google Play services. So instead, I want to move on to TensorFlow. We really think that TensorFlow 
is the perfect application for the on-device processing of your Android Things device. So as you've heard from some of the previous talks on Android Things, Android Things is not really well suited if you're just making a simple sensor. To fully utilize the Android Things platform, it should be doing more. There should be some intelligence on this device. You might wonder, though, if you're making an internet-connected device, an IoT device, why do you actually need this on-device processing? And there's actually several reasons why this could be really important. One reason has to do with bandwidth. If, for example, you're making a camera that's counting the number of people in a line, and you just care about that number, by only propagating out that number, you save huge amounts on bandwidth by not ne needing to send the image anywhere. The second reason for on-device processing has to do with when you have intermittent connectivity. So if your device is only sometimes connected to the internet, for it to be really functional, it needs to have that on-device processing for when it's offline. The next reason for on-device processing has to do with the principle of least privilege. So if you, again, have that camera where you, all you care about is the number of, of people standing in a line, by the principle of least privilege, you should only be propagating that number even if you trust the other end where you're sending it. There's also some regulatory reasons where this could be important for your use case. The final reason for on-device processing has to do with real-time applications. So if you're, for example, making a robot that has to navigate through an environment, you want to have on-device processing. So if something comes in front of that robot, you'll be able to react to the situation. Again, I want to mention that we have a code lab for TensorFlow and Android Things. So you can try it out in the code lab area or at home. But to really show you TensorFlow in action, I actually want to do a live demo so we can really see that it works. So what I have here, it's a pretty simple setup. We have one of our supported boards, which is a Raspberry Pi in this case, as well as a button, a camera, and a speaker. The button's here on top. The camera is actually located in this, this little Android head's eye. So it's in its eye right there. And then the speaker's in its mouth. So what's going to happen is when I press the button, the camera will take a picture. That image is then sent through a TensorFlow model located locally on the device. And then the speaker will then say what that TensorFlow model thinks it saw. So for you here today, I have various dog breeds. Because locally on this TensorFlow model, I have what's called the inception model. Now, the inception model is a model provided by Google that's able to identify thousands of objects, including dog breeds. So let's see if it can do it. I just need to line up the image and I see a Dalmatian. All right. So for those of you who couldn't see, yeah, it deserves an applause. It is, in fact, a Dalmatian. But let's do it one more time to show you that you know, can do more than just one dog read. So this time I have a French bulldog. All right. Line it up again. Hope for the best. Hey, that looks like me. Just kidding. I see a French bulldog. All right. Yeah. Good job, little guy. So as I mentioned, this is all running totally locally. So this is not connected to the internet at all. And since it's battery powered, it's totally portable. So I think that this example um, really shows you some of the power you can get with TensorFlow. So now let's actually walk through some of the code that makes this integration possible. This first page, as you can see, is pretty simple. And this just shows us loading up the appropriate TensorFlow library to be used by our device. The first thing I want you to note here is that we're actually only loading the, the same libraries as is used by Android. So all the TensorFlow code that works on Android will also work on Android Things. All the samples that you already have on Android for TensorFlow, you can port immediately to Android Things. The second thing I want you to note is that here we're actually only loading in the inference libraries of TensorFlow. 
TensorFlow is basically composed of two sets of libraries. There's training, which is where you give it thousands of images along with labels so you can make that model that can make those predictions. And then there's the inference libraries. We are using that model that you trained to actually make those predictions. So now let's go some of the core functionality to actually do those predictions. So these are the steps to actually run input data through a TensorFlow model. The first method you see there, the feed method, is where you're actually loading in your input data. So we have three arguments. There's the input layer name, which is simply that first layer of your TensorFlow model where you're going to put your input data. Next, there's tensor dimensions, which simply describes the structure of your input layer so you can understand what's going into your model. Then you have image pixels, which is the actual input data which you're going to make predictions on. So here, in our case, since we're taking a picture, of course, the input data is pixels. But this same type of TensorFlow model will work across many use cases. So if instead you had just sensor data or a combination of sensor data and camera data, you could use this same type of TensorFlow model, and it would still work. So the next line, the actual highlighted portion, is where the actual work gets done. So we call the run method to actually run this input data through our TensorFlow model to get that prediction on the other side. So here we just need to provide the output layer where we want the data to go. Finally, we need to fetch our data so we can use it. So we call fetch along with an output array to store our data. Now this output array is composed of elements that correspond to the confidence that a, an object is what we saw on the image. So in our first example, we predicted Dalmatian. That means that the element with, with highest confidence was that that corresponded to Dalmatian. You could actually do a little bit more nuanced things with this, these results. So for example, if there's two results that both were highly confident, you could say, I think it's one of these two things. And if there were no results uh, where you were, there was no results above a certain threshold of confidence, you could say, I don't know what's in this image. So even once you have your output of confidences, you can do a little bit extra depending on your use case. So as I mentioned, this demo is running completely locally. But I think that there's actually more interesting things that we can do once we also connect devices like this to the cloud. So next, I want to talk about Google Cloud Platform, and specifically Cloud IoT Core. So Cloud IoT Core is a new offering that we're announcing here at I.O. that's specifically for connecting IoT devices to the Google Cloud Platform. Now, the Google Cloud Platform has a number of services. You can do things like MQTT protocol support. MQTT is a lightweight protocol that's used for communications as well as many industrial purposes. Cloud IoT Core is also a 100% managed service. This means you get things like automatic load balancing and res resource pre-provisioning. You, you can connect one device to Cloud IoT Core or a million devices. And all these things still work the same way. There's also a global access point, which means that no matter what region your device is in, it can use the same configurations and connect to the same Google Cloud. Cloud IoT Core also comes with a device manager that can allow you to interact with your devices in the field. So you get things like the ability to configure individual devices that you have in the field, as well as control those devices, set up alerts, and set up role-level access controls. Role-level access controls could be something like allowing one user to be able to have read and write access over a set of devices, and then another user could only have read access over a subset of those devices. So as I mentioned, Cloud IoT Core also connects you to all the benefits of Google Cloud Platform. This diagram shows you a bunch of the benefits that Google Cloud Platform provides. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to point out a few. You get things like BigQuery and Bigtable that allow you to input all the data that you're gathering from your Android Things devices and then visualize and query over that data. You also get Cloud ML to make even more complicated machine learning models that you've, based on all the data you've collected 
using the, the power of the cloud. Finally, you get all the analytics tools that Google Cloud Platform provides to visualize and set up alerts on your data and take action on the devices you have in the field. So to understand these analytics a little bit better, I want to go through one more demo. So this demo is actually running live in our sandbox area. And this is just a screenshot of it working. What we've done here is we've set up a bunch of environmental stations running on Android things and spread them around Mountain View campus. Now, these environmental stations have a bunch of sensors on them, things like humidity sensor, temperature sensor, air pressure sensor, luminosity sensor, and motion detection. And then we're able to aggregate all this data in the cloud by connecting it through a cloud IoT core. So on the left, you can see some of the data from some of these devices they were able to aggregate. We can also see average temperatures and other analytics on our data. We can also dive in to one, um, one specific device to really see more data on what's going on with that device, as well as more time series data on, on how that device has performed over time. You might notice, though, that this demo shows you really well that you can connect these devices to Google Cloud, but it doesn't really utilize the on-device processing that I talked about with my TensorFlow demo. So next, I want to go over a few more examples that show you these two services working together. Because when you combine TensorFlow and Google Cloud Platform, I think you can do some really amazingly powerful things. So my first example kind of extends this environmental station demo that I just walked you through. Imagine instead of just putting these environmental stations around, we actually connected them to a smart vending machine. We were then able to use all the input data from our environmental station to have a machine learning model using TensorFlow running locally on this device. You could predict things like supply and demand based on that vending machine's environment, and then optimize when this vending machine would be restocked. You could also connect all of your vending machines to the cloud and do even more complicated analysis on those vending machines. You could do inventory analysis to figure out which items are performing best in which environments. And you could also do even better prediction models based on all the data you're collecting. This is actually a perfect example to do what we call federated learning. So federated learning is when we have multiple machines that are all able to learn locally. But based on those local learning, we can aggregate that data to make an even better machine learning model in the cloud. So here you can imagine having one vending machine in a school and another vending machine in a stadium. And both vending machines would have very personalized models based on their environment. But they would also both benefit from each other by aggregating their data in the cloud. This is also a good example that shows you can do interesting things without a camera, just using sensor data. But my next example goes over a camera use case. Because I think that cameras are perfect applications for doing some of this on-device processing. So imagine you have a grocery store. And the grocery store puts up cameras to count the number of people standing in line. This camera would use a TensorFlow model that's locally able to count that number of people in the image and propagate that number to the cloud. You could use this data to open the optimal number of registers at any given time, so you never have to wait in line at the grocery store again. With all of your aggregated data, you could also do more complicated machine learning models. You could predict how many people you should staff at your grocery store on any given day. You could also see how optimal each grocery store is performing and the differences between grocery stores. This could even be useful for the shoppers, the end users. You could imagine making a mobile app where, at home, you can check how long the grocery store line is so that you never are frustrated by having to wait in line, because you'll know in advance what the situation will be. The next use case I want to go over broadens this camera example a little bit more and applies it to an industrial use case. 
So imagine we have a factory that, let's say, makes pizzas. And we add a camera that's able to do quality control to increase both the quality and the efficiency for this industrial application. I should note that we have another talk that's specifically on enterprise use cases on Android things. So you should listen to that talk if you want to know more about what's possible on Android things for some of these industrial applications. So in this case, we would have a TensorFlow model that's locally able to learn how to accept and reject pizzas by, for example, counting the number of toppings of, of each pizza. So as we see some of these pizzas go by, most of them we'll see have six tomatoes and five olives. And so they're accepted. But then soon, we'll come to one, this one, or no, sorry, that, there, that one, that has too, many tomato, uh, too few tomatoes and too few olives. Sorry, too few tomatoes and too many olives, so we reject that pizza. We can also propagate this data to the cloud to do more analysis, such as track our throughput and flag if our error rate goes above a certain threshold, and we want to do a manual check on our machines. There's one more use case I want to go over that uses machine learning in a slightly different way. So that's going to be reinforcement learning applied to an agricultural use case. So imagine we have a field that has a bunch of moisture sensors in the ground, as well as sprinklers. Then, and these are all connected to a central hub running Android Things. Now, this Android Things hub could do some machine learning to optimize exactly what the output of when and how much water each sprinkler should, should output to optimize our crop growth. You may have heard of DeepMind. Sundar actually mentioned in his keynote as a company at Alphabet that recently made AlphaGo, which beat the best Go player in the world. Now, this used reinforcement learning in really powerful ways. And I think that reinforcement learning is an amazing tool that could also be used on Android things really well. With reinforcement learning, you could discover some nuanced use cases, such, such as imagine your hill had a, a, a hill on it. In that case, you may actually want to water the crops at the bottom of the hill less than those at the top of the hill, because the sprinklers at the top of the hill might have runoff water that'll add the extra water to the crops at the bottom of the hill. So Android Things makes integrations like these really seamless and provides you the tools to do anything that you imagine. And I think that using things like TensorFlow and Cloud together can also do some really amazing use cases that you can't do with just one. Combining these services could do so much more for your device and for your end users. There's one more service I want to talk about today, and that's the Google Assistant. So Android Things supports the Google Assistant SDK. Now, there's a huge number of use cases that we think the Assistant can do, do for you. It allows you to connect to all the knowledge of Google, as well as allows you to control the devices in your home. Again, we have a code lab that goes over getting Android things to work with the Google Assistant. So you can do it at home, or you can do it in our sandbox area. We also partnered with AIY, which is a group at Google that makes kits for do-it-yourself artificial intelligence makers. And so what you see on the screen here is the kit they recently re released, the voice kit, that is one of the easiest ways that you can get started with Android things working with the Google Assistant. Before I end my talk today, I want to go over one more feature of Android Things. And that's the Android Things Developer Console. The Android Things Developer Console brings all these services together. It's our new developer portal, which we're going to release soon, that lets you add all these services to your device in a really simple way. The key with the Android Things Developer Console is customization you get ultimate control of exactly what services will go on your device when using the Android Things Developer Console. You also get device management and updates. So this allows you to create your projects, as well as uh, upload your own APKs for your own device functionality, and push those feature updates to your devices in the field. 
The Android Things Developer Console is also where you'll get all the updates from Google. So these are the security updates and the feature updates that will make your devices secure. Now, since you get total control with the Developer Console, you get to control which updates you take and exactly when these updates push out. But I believe that the customization of the Developer Console gives you the control to really create anything that you can imagine. Unlocking this unlimited potential of what we think is possible of Android things, especially when combined with Google services. So to summarize, Android things gives you that platform that makes hardware development feasible. It gives you all the Android APIs to make your development process easy, combined with this system on module design to make it quick and economical to make a prototype and also bring that device to production. But the services on top, I believe, are the huge factor that allows you to really innovate and enhance your device, as well as bring new features to your users. So we have Google Play services, which gives you the suite of tools, like the mobile vision APIs, location services, as well as Firebase. You get TensorFlow, which uses the powerful on-device processing of your Android Things device to add that intelligence to your device. You also get Google Cloud Platform and specifically Cloud IoT Core to connect your device to the even greater intelligence of the cloud. And finally, you get the Google Assistant, the latest and greatest in Google's personal assistant technology. All of these services and any that come in the future will fit on top of Android Things to unlock this potential of your device. I want to leave you today with my call to action. We have a huge number of sessions on Android Things this year, as well as demos and code labs for you to learn more about what's possible on Android Things. We also have a developer site where you can visit to download the latest Android Things image and start making your idea. I encourage you to add some of these Google services to your device to see how powerful they really can be. And then tell us about it. Join our developer community, where thousands of people are already asking questions, sharing their ideas, sharing their prototypes, and getting feedback. Again, I'm Sam Beter, and I look forward to hearing about all the amazing devices they are building on Android Things that integrate these powerful Google services. Thank you.